Welcome to In Her Voice. My name is Kelly Covert, and I am passionate about helping women live authentically by listening to their inner voice. Get ready to be inspired by women of all walks of life that have set aside their should be's and not good enoughs and are standing in their true voice, the voice of wisdom that each and every one of us has inside. Hello, you guys. This is Kelly, and thank you, thank you, thank you for pressing play on In Her Voice today. You are not going to regret it. I have a really amazing guest, Jennifer Longmore, on today, and we're talking about living with purpose and not just any purpose, but your soul's purpose. You are going to dig it. I'm sure. I'm sure, sure, sure. So before we get to that, I just want to let you guys know that I have a newsletter that I send out every week or so, sometimes every two weeks, sometimes every three weeks, but it's my way of connecting with you guys and letting you know what's going on and giving you a little bit of inspiration and something to think about, something to chew on. So if you love In Her Voice and you love the guests that I have and you love anything having to do with connecting with your own inner voice and you love diving deeper into that practice, I encourage you to head on over to kellycover.com slash newsletter, put your email in and sign up. And then you'll have me in your email inbox. I almost said e-box. That's funny. You'll have me in your inbox and you can also connect with me that way. So when you get an email from me, guess what? You can email me back, which is awesome because I love connecting with you guys. So go check it out, put your email in and get on my list. The link for that is kellycover.com slash newsletter. And there is a live link right in the podcast app that you are listening to. So maybe pause right now and go do it. And then come back and listen to my amazing interview with Jennifer. So let me get her bio up and read that for you. Jennifer Longmore, North America's sole purpose expert, internationally acclaimed host of Soul Purpose Central, and three-time best-selling author, is world-renowned for her laser-like clarity in seeing into the depths of your soul and bridging your connection to universal consciousness. For more than 15 years, she has served clients in permanently shifting the limiting beliefs and patterns that prevent them from being who they really are so that they can live their most abundant, aligned, and accelerated soul's journey. With over 30,000 soul purpose sessions, including the who's who of actors, professional athletes, CEOs of leading companies, and other influential luminaries, Jennifer continues to offer these high-level sessions to souls who are really committed to shine their light. And oh my gosh, you guys, this idea of shining your light, this is something that keeps coming back up to me over and over and over. And Jennifer and I talk about that in this interview and more. So sit back, relax, and listen to Jennifer and I talk about finding your soul's true purpose. Jennifer Longmore, I'm so excited to welcome you to In Her Voice. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and that we've made it. Oh, I know. We had a little bit of technical (laughs) difficulty, Um, but we're here and um, and it's meant to be and I feel like our conversation is going to be so amazing. So um, we have a lot to talk about today, but I want to start with your path. How did you get to where you are now? Well, (laughs) that's a long story, but the nutshell version is I grew up in a very spiritual household. So my maternal grandfather was solving crimes with the police as a psychic medium. My parents and I went for our first past life regression when we were, when I was four, I should say, not when we were four. (laughs) And, uh, So I just thought that was the way everyone's family is. And I'm sure everyone listening can relate because you don't know what you don't know. And you just assume everyone's living the same reality as you. It wasn't until I went to school that I realized, oh, I was making people feel really uncomfortable. And I didn't like that feeling. And I didn't know how to navigate my knowingness and not knowing that I was telling people things they didn't know and their discomfort. And so I really felt like I struggled socially for a long time 
And uh, when I got to uh, grade eight, grade nine, I started going to field parties and drinking and smoking pot and all that kind of stuff, just as a way to fit in. I didn't really like doing those things. It didn't feel good in my body. But I was really angry with the universe that they gave me this gift, which I didn't see as a gift at that time. I thought maybe I was going crazy. And then by the time I finished high school, I realized, you know, I've just got to lean into this because it's not going away. (laughs) And what would happen? Me resisting it isn't making it better. So what would happen if I just leaned into it? And that's when magic started to happen. I love this idea of leaning in because I think so often what we perceive as our flaws or as the things that we don't want are actually our gifts. They're actually that thing that make us so special and so unique. And so when we lean in instead of resist, that's where we can really start to understand who we actually are, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And I think for a lot of us that are claircognizant, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that are claircognizant, when you know what you know and you can't explain it and you grow up in an, in an empirical world that asks you to justify your knowingness all the time, it can be really challenging. And then you inevitably start to question yourself and question your knowingness and question your validity in the world and your meaning and so on and so on because you're so used to being questioned as someone who knows it all basically like how do you know that so i feel Mm -hmm. like for those of us that are claircognizant we we may struggle a little bit more with expressing ourselves because we're aware that what we say a lot of times makes people feel uncomfortable and we're not even sure why Yeah. Well, so when you begin to really lean in to it and begin to sort of see it as something that couldn't be ignored, couldn't be turned down, so to speak, how did you figure that out? Like, how did you come to this place of acceptance and knowing and feeling okay about everything? I started just having fun with it. I started going to past life regression circles with my mom and crystal healing sessions and, you know, those psychic expos that you can go to that have crystals and oracle cards everywhere. And that was back in the day when Louise Hay was just kind of coming out with her book, You Can Heal Your Life. My mom actually got me that for me when I think I was about 17 or 18. So it was still kind of, you know, on the periphery and that was kind of cool (laughs) because I like zigging when everyone else is zagging. It's kind of my personality. Uh, But it wasn't until I did Reiki, I had manifested a car accident. My car was spinning out of control, not unlike my life at that time. And um, so my mom did reflexology. She had a really close friend that did Reiki. So they agreed to do exchanges for me. So I could receive some Reiki because I was in school and really couldn't afford it. I ended up getting my Reiki mastery. And that's when the energetic piece of what I knew came together. So all the intuitive stuff was already there. When I had the the mixture of the energy with it, I felt like I got a whole, um, like a broader language for what I was doing. Everything just started to make sense. And I often say that Reiki is like the gateway drug for healers. It, it opens you up to what you really meant to be doing. So a few years after I got my Reiki mastery, I ended up downloading uh, all kinds of messages from the Akashic Records while I was sleeping and inevitably went on to teach that because it really was just, it wouldn't leave me alone. I had no choice <laughs> but to offer that as a mm-hmm. service. And so yeah. 15 years later, here I am doing over 30,000 Akashic Record readings and um, teaching classes all over the world and having a great time. Yeah, I love this story. So for my listeners who might not know what the Akashic Records are, can you just briefly explain what you mean when you say that? Absolutely. So the Akashic Records are basically your soul's blueprint, your soul's path in this lifetime. So everyone you're meant to meet and the parents you chose to give you all of the learning that you needed and what you're here to master and what you're here to share, all of that is built into your chart, basically. So imagine it's like an astrology chart, but it holds all the information about your soul from other lifetimes as well, along with um you know, certain predictive things in your future of where you're growing and um, how your past kind of dictates what might happen in your future. Mm. So what you really help people do with this is understand what their soul's calling is. Am I right? Yes. Yes. That was very succinct. when, (laughs) When I, when I say 
um, my soul's calling or my soul's true purpose, by the way, which I, I really believe that deep inside of our soul, like our soul knows that. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what the Akashic record is. That's what I hear you saying. Yes. So we have that information inside of us. Yes. Um, and you really help people access that and understand it. But what is a soul purpose? Like, you know, that's a really broad thing. I mean, like, does that mm-hmm. mean that's the work we're supposed to be doing or that's like our lifetime achievement? You know, what, what <laughs> does that mean? Oh, it's such a great question. And I'm, I'm so with you. It is, it is very layered. So at the core of it, all of us already come in with a purpose. All of us matter. All of us have meaning. All of us are here to have impact in different ways. So a lot of people question that and they have what I call existential crises, which can manifest in depression. Sometimes as we've seen recently in suicide, where we just, we can't make sense of life and it, it just, we don't understand why we're here. And it all seems a little bit too crazy for us. Uh, But our purpose is to be, and our purpose is to accumulate experiences that we then integrate as wisdom and share with other people. Our purpose is to receive wisdom from other people. And in doing so, in that exchange of energy, almost like an infinity symbol, we send that information back to the universe and the universe evolves as we evolve. So then we each have our own imprint. We have a way in which we're meant to show up in the world. So some of us are messengers, some of us are teachers, some of us are healers, some of us are um, journalists, advocates, agitators. We all have certain archetypes that we kind of live from. So for example, with me, a teacher is a massive archetype for me. And anytime I, I teach anything in my business, it always does really well because I'm staying within my archetype. But throughout my whole life, I wanted to be a teacher and people always came to me and asked me to teach them something, whatever it was. Even when I get involved in new things like real estate or investing in the stock market, people will say, can you teach me how to do that? And so I share that because that's a clue for us to look for what do people keep asking? What what keeps circling me that I'm maybe not paying attention to or I didn't give too much credit to, especially those things that come natural, we sometimes don't feel like we should be able to get paid for the things that come so easy that we could do it in our sleep, or that we would pay for the privilege of doing. Yeah, I think that this is so fascinating. And it's such a good practice to put into place to really pay attention, what people come to you for. Because oftentimes, our most natural ability and our most natural gift we don't see it as being that because we think everybody thinks like that or we think everybody is like that and we don't understand that that's not how it is (laughs) and um and I think that that becomes a really powerful place to view who we are from because then it allows us to start tapping into that so it's like just going one layer or two layers deeper from what you're seeing from other people. Do you have any um, ways that we can become more aware of that? There, yes, there are a ton of ways. Of course, the Akashic Records are one of them. I actually created a free gift on my website that has people asking some questions of themselves to get a little more clear and questions that they can ask, um, you know, of other people that know them. That, like you said, we all actually know what our purpose is. So many times when I tell people what their purpose is, it's not me telling them, of course, it's their guides telling them. But uh, they'll say, oh, yeah, I kind of knew that. We're, we're actually less afraid of knowing our purpose and more afraid of what's going to be required of us when we live our purpose. So we will create oh. this energy of I'm not clear or I don't know or that we get really hung up in the mechanics. Well, am I supposed to do Reiki or am I supposed to do massage therapy? <laughs> you know, if you're a healer, you'll be led to whatever your mechanism is supposed to be and it will change over time. But it's really that the two things are uh, I notice people are really afraid of living their purpose because they're not entirely sure that the universe has their back and they feel unsafe. The, the second thing is they, um, they're afraid of letting the universe down. 
they're just afraid of screwing it all up, getting it wrong and wasting time focusing on a purpose that never really mattered or existed and or disappointing the universe. And uh, the other piece is over responsibility. Oh, that's such a big purpose. I can't do it all myself. So people will contract and shrink because of the assumptions that they're making rather than understanding that there's always an answer to all of our questions. Oh, I love it so much. Like, I just feel like when we come into this understanding that we're protected and that we're safe and that we have everything that we need and that the universe wants good for us, like (laughs) that, you know, it's like a, a parent, like you always want good for your child. You don't want bad things to happen. You would never wish bad things to happen. And that's, that's how we should feel. on a day-to-day basis oh i i love that so much well so let's let's dig into this a little bit you say that some people feel unsafe like there's Mm -hmm. a fear there that if they step in they're they're gonna be coming outside of that um safety they're gonna be putting themselves at risk Mm -hmm. and one of one of your superpowers is really helping people shift their perception. Mm -hmm. So how do we begin to shift our perception that we are not safe or that, that we're making a misstep? Oh, that's such a great question. I've been hearing from people recently saying things like, I'm terrified to write a book or I'm just paralyzed by fear to do something. And usually people will say this around times where there's world events going on, where people are literally uh, running from a subway because a bomb's gone off. And I'm thinking, you know, that's real terror. (laughs) And it's not to minimize people's feelings, but we use these very um, charged words to describe something that is just illusion. Unless there's an actual risk to our safety, our our fear monger, our, our monkey mind is really just trying to keep us small because our ego is designed to protect us and our soul is designed to help us feel expansive. So anytime we're not facing a real fear, and by that I mean, you know, a legitimate, I've got a, you know, fight or flight sort of moment, then we mm-hmm. know that's illusion. That with, That's already our cue to say, okay, I'm buying into a perception that's inaccurate because I know in my core that the universe only wants good things for me and it wants to provide for me whatever I ask for. And then uh, that I'm here for a reason. And that, you know, at the core of all of our questions, by the way, is am I okay? And is everything going to be okay? That's really what Mm. people ask me every time they get on the phone. And I don't, I I don't minimize that at all. Just at the core, that's what drives it, right? We just want to feel safe. And that's our first illusion. We have so much um, religious imprinting and mind control implants and all kinds of things that float around in society, subliminal programs, parental programming, generational stuff that tells us that this isn't a safe world and that God, and I say God loosely, universe, source, whatever, is a judging and punishing God. And so why would we feel safe when those programs are kind of permeating our subconscious all the time? It's natural that we would buy into that illusion. Yeah. Yeah. I think I love this, um, this talk about how people say these really strong things, like I'm terrified. And it's super interesting to me because, um, part of what I do is I'm a professional flutist and I teach at the college level. So I'm teaching, um, you know, people who are becoming professional musicians. And one of the things that we run into a lot is stage fright. Hmm. So they or performance anxiety. So they get up on stage and they like freak out. And, um, you know, what I say to them is, is you have to remember that you're safe. Everyone in the audience is there because they love you and they want you to do well. And, you know, what you're feeling is actually left over from like an, an evolutionary past that that is just like got stuck there so it's like for like when the caveman would walk outside of their cave and there would be a bear there waiting to eat them like that's where that feeling comes from and so when we start to separate out and make more sense of okay this feeling that i'm feeling like sweaty palms heart rate really high like i have no moisture in my mouth right that's all left over from those real fear days that we don't have to believe anymore and i think that's so powerful to to start to understand that so much of our fear 
even though we really feel it, like truly, it's based on something that we're imagining. Yes. It's based on something that's not even real because it's like this, you know, daydream, not in the good sense, nightmare, I should say, right? That we've created about what's going to happen. And we, when we really start to sit with, okay, what is real right now? I think that makes it a little bit easier. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting that you bring up stage fright because I do a lot of speaking in public and someone gave me a really good tip years ago and I applied it not that long ago because I could feel that, you know, the clammy palms and my throat drying up. And they said to me that they just kept repeating, I don't need anything from you. They were kind of projecting it onto the audience before they went on. I don't need anything from you. I don't need anything from you. I don't need anything from you. And you just say it in all the different tones that come up, right? Because some, the inner child in you is maybe feeling a little indignant, a little scared, um, a little bit um, irritated, whatever the case may be. But as kids, we uh, think that the world is like the family we live in. We have no reason to believe that it's not. So whatever our experience was at home, we tend to expect the same as we grow up. We just don't realize it. The same is true in business. And we're already preparing for what we expect. So if we're used to being criticized and judged at home, we're already bracing for that. So part of us will shape how we show up because we need to continue getting the validation that we suck or (laughs) that we're not worthy or maybe we need approval. Whatever it is we're needing, that's our need. And as soon as we clear out the need, then we can actually show up for the audience because then we really shift into, oh, it's about you guys. It's just about me showing up and letting the divine move through me. It's not about what I need to take from you. And we've all been in performances, whether it's a a speech or a musical performance or whatever, where the speaker had a lot of great points, but they just fell flat. You couldn't hear what they're saying because they're reading from a sheet or they're just really trying to get through it. As soon as they relax, then all of a sudden they can receive the energy from the audience and then it lifts them up even more. Yeah, I feel like there's an element of trust. So when when I really think about when I'm speaking in front of a crowd or when I'm playing on a stage, I really have to fully trust that the people that are there aren't taking from me, like in a negative way. Do you know what I mean? Like, so it's mm-hmm. like this, this trust, like they're trusting me, but I also have to trust them. I also have to trust them to create a space for me that is loving. And when I trust that, that is when I feel the most comfortable and the most at ease and in flow. I don't have to look at my notes. I don't have to worry about raising my eyes away from the music because my body is just going to go with it. Hmm. That's nice. And I think, yeah. And I think when, when, you know, this, this talk, we're talking about performing and a lot of you that are listening or be, or might feel like, well, like I'm not a performer, like I'm not going to get up on stage and give a speech or I'm not going to, you know, play an instrument or whatever. And that's fine. But I feel like these are just bigger, bigger venues for the same kinds of lessons that we can apply on a day-to-day basis. Maybe your quote unquote performance is going in to talk to your boss or um, really having an intimate, vulnerable conversation with your partner. Whatever that quote unquote performance is, you have to have that trust and you have to remember that you're coming in in full service in giving and not really needing anything back from that. Don't you think? Oh, absolutely. It's applicable everywhere. We're always performing, as you mentioned. It just, there's different stakes <laughs> at different times, but uh, we always want to put our best self forward, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so speaking of best self, this kind of brings me back to something that I really wanted to touch on with you. And that is, um, you mentioned on your website in your about page, which I love, by the way, those are my, <laughs> that's always my favorite page of everyone's website. I, I want to go read the story. Um, but that when you started school, you started to realize that not everyone was like you, mm-hmm. which you hadn't had that realization up to that point. And so what you did was you began to dull, like pull back to hold back 
part of you, possibly even abandon that part of you that seemed weird or crazy or whatever. And I feel that so often, especially as women, we do this. I see women, grown women every single day pulling back in the fear that they're going to hurt someone's feelings or that they're going to outshine someone or that they're going to be too much. I hear this all the time. Like, I just feel like I'm too much. And I, I'd love to hear you talk about this because I, I just think it's so pervasive. And I have reached this point where when I hear women say that I like it triggers something in me so (laughs) deep and I just want to like shake them and say you can shine like you're allowed to be who you are and that's not going to take away from anyone but how do we how do we internalize that lesson Oh boy, that's a, a big one, isn't it? I, even to this day, sometimes, because I have a presence, right? I'm actually very mellow and I'm chill and I try to be understated. I just like to wear yoga pants basically <laughs> whenever I can. But I'll get a, off an airplane and enter into the, um, you know, terminal area and everyone will turn their head and stare at me. And I can feel their energy trying to figure me out. And uh, it's, it can be uncomfortable. Then I realized, oh, okay, I just have a presence. That's what people are responding to. Okay, well, they can, they can absorb it or not. Uh, but the cool thing is, is that because we're always going to be too much or not enough for people, we're not going to win either way. And it really isn't a game anyways. So let's just be ourselves. There's a saying that says, when um, someone says that you're shining too brightly, they're more than welcome to put on a pair of sunglasses. Right uh-huh. until yes. <laughs> until they're ready to see us, and you know, even for me, and I'm sure the same is true for you and others listening. I really like engaging with strong women, and it doesn't mean I like mm-hmm. them as a person. And meaning, like maybe we just don't resonate, but I still respect what they're creating, and I respect anyone that's putting themselves out there and and committed to their work. So even though they might be too aggressive for me, or too quiet for me or whatever the case may be they're really not that's just that i'm not resonating with them and we're not meant to resonate with everyone we're meant to resonate first and foremost with ourselves, and then whoever our soul family is basically right our soul family and those include friends and family members and so on are the ones that just accept us for who we are Mm. what does it mean to you to resonate with yourself Uh, when I'm being my own best friend, you know, when I catch myself saying supportive things to me or when I look in the mirror and I think, girl, you got it going on today or, you know, whatever, or when I'm interacting with my son and I'm thinking, yeah, I, I really feel good about that interaction or with my partner. Uh, if I've said something to him that I see puts a smile on his face and I know I was mindful about that comment, I feel good about that. So it's really about trying to be as aligned, I think, as possible to what my values are and allowing myself to catch a break and allowing myself to just be who I am in the moment. And similar to that book, The Four Agreements, if anyone's read it, we're just always doing our best and our best is going to change from day to day. But as long as I feel like I've done my best in each moment, then that allows me to feel like I'm resonating with the essence of who I really am. Mm, I love that. And then on the other side of that, what does it feel like for you when you're not resonating with yourself or when you're out of alignment? I was just going to say, and then there's times where you catch yourself getting frustrated with the cashier at the store or, you know, someone's not driving fast enough and you feel a certain emotion come up. And it, it's so unnecessary because it is what it is in that moment. Like that moment's not going to change, right? Especially with driving right. and things like that. But I certainly feel pretty yucky. And sometimes I can fester in that for a little bit. Not the emotion, but the the remorse around, you know, oh, I wish I had handled that differently or I wish I had have held different energy around that particular thing. So it's those moments as well that I don't try and hang out in that too long and make myself wrong for it. I just go, okay. Well, now you know you really don't like the way that feels, so let's just give ourselves like a three-second rule or something the next time this happens and take a breath before responding. 
Yeah, I love how you you you're saying that you're giving yourself a boundary around that. So you're not saying you're you're not allowed to feel that way because mm -hmm. we're going to feel the way we're going to feel. But when that pops up, that bad feeling, whatever it is, like, you know, road rage or like you want to scream at your kid or whatever, you just you give yourself a boundary around that. Okay, I'm going to feel this for a few seconds. Then I'm going to decide, is this how I really want to feel? And that really puts the ball in your own court. I feel like that gives us so much um, freedom to choose how we want to feel going throughout the day, which, you know, instead of waiting for someone to make me feel good or make me feel bad, then I get to really decide in any given moment, am I going to take this or am I going to leave it? Hmm. Yeah, I so like that. I I love that. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm interested to know too when you come out of alignment, and you know, you've you've already given yourself that boundary. I think at, for me, I'll speak for me. Sometimes it's still really hard mm -hmm. to get back in. So I'm curious if you have a practice or something that you do to like get yourself back up to that resonating power. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things I do. I think it's incumbent upon us to manage our energy all day. I definitely like to start my day managing my energy because if I don't set the tone for my day, someone else will, right? Just as it is true for the rest of us. Because as soon as you open an email or take a phone call, that's someone else's agenda. So that means you're already taking on someone else's agenda if you haven't already set the tone for the day. So I like to focus on the future and I like to focus on this is the day I'm having as opposed to this is the day I'm going to have. And then throughout the day, every time I go and encounter something that I know I'm going to encounter, if I'm going to a meeting or if I'm on a call with a client or, um, you know, I'm going to see um, my osteopath or whatever, I always expect the end better. And I like to stay in that zone. And then when I catch myself, because my son will do things like right now, this might be TMI, but he's seven going on eight. And he has found a part of his body that he really enjoys <laughs> a lot. And uh, I really don't like to have being mama boys. <laughs> oh, geez. So I obviously don't want to shame him around that part of his body. But uh, like, I'm kind of tired now of continually saying you need to go in another room if you want to do that and finding different ways around that. So uh, now he thinks that if he's wearing his shorts and he puts his hands in his shorts and yanks them around and like does all this rapid movement that somehow that's masking it, right? He just doesn't have a concept. And it's just basically become a bad habit. The reality is that he's going to be put in a position at some point where someone really loses their marbles on him because uh, they feel it's inappropriate. And I want to be teaching him to be more mindful of, of his, you know, personal space and, and what that means and teaching him about that so we both talked about it but at what point you know do you do you try and encourage and at one point do you have to kind of lay down the law right it's a mm -hmm. it's a balancing act so instead of focusing on the issue I go okay what kind of parent do I want to be in this moment and what do I want to be remembered for do I want to be remembered as the nag or do I want to be remembered as the accept, accepting mom that loves him no matter what? He's already perfect, whole, and complete. If I'm seeing anything that, uh, you know, suggests otherwise, that's on me. That's not on him. And so when I go into mm -hmm. that zone, then I can come at it from a different energy because uh, it really is my own stuff, right? And maybe it's, oh, what will the neighbors think? Or, <laughs> you know, what's really going on here? Is this going to get, you know, whatever my assumptions are, who knows what they are at that time. But when I focus on who, who I want to be and how I want to be remembered, that can really help me shift. And that's the same with, again, dealing with cashiers or going out for meals or whatever, uh, wanting to make sure that I'm showing up as the person that I really want to be received as. Mm, I love that so much. I, I heard this great thing on a podcast one day, and I can't remember who it was that said it. Someone very smart and <laughs> very in tune, but he was saying how he does this door frame practice. And so every time that he walks through a door, before he walks to the door, he thinks about who he wants to be or how he wants to be when he walks through that door. And so like if he's had a long day at work and it's been really frustrating before he walks through his door at home, he'll think about, okay, now this is my opportunity to set the intention for who I want to be after I walk through that door. And it takes just a few seconds, but it really 
allows you to be clear and to choose instead of to always be in that reactive state. And I know that <laughs> motherhood has really helped me with that. <laughs> but you don't, ha- you don't have to go have a kid to learn how to do that. It's just about being mindful and about being aware and about setting those intentions about who you want to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So good. Um, well, so I, this, I feel like we could just go on. I feel like this has been a little <laughs> rambling and, and, but I, I really think that this is just what we needed today. So I hope that you ladies that are listening really feel like you had one really strong takeaway, whatever that is. And be sure to share that with us because we would love to know. So Jennifer, why don't you let people know how they could learn more about you and connect with you and your work? Well, thank you. Uh, Well, you can find me at www.souljourneys.ca. That's where I mentioned the free gift. I think it's called the nine most powerful questions to align to your soul's purpose. So I've got more information in there about the Akashic records and questions that you can dive into. I like to give valuable gifts for free (laughs) instead of just little, you know, tiny things. And then I spend a lot of time on Facebook. I actually have a Facebook group called the Purpose Posse. And that's for anyone that's, you know, wanting to live their purpose. It doesn't matter what what level, so to speak, you feel you're at. That's um, a great place to hang out and ask questions and just be around people that speak the same language, basically. Mm, I love it. And we'll put links to all of that stuff, including the nine questions, the free gift of the nine questions, which I'm going to go do right now, because what a great thing to pull in to a journaling practice or something like that. And I, what I love about this kind of work is wherever you are on your journey, it's going to be helpful to ask yourself these questions and to dive in. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, thank you. I appreciate being on. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, so, um, I, did I say, I feel like I didn't say you, you can find all of those direct links right in the podcast app that you guys are listening to. So you can go click on over, get your questions and journal away. Um, so Jennifer, I always like to end each episode with the same question that I ask all of my guests. And that is in your life currently, what is your inner voice asking of you? Definitely time to recalibrate. It's time to evaluate what's working, what's not, and redefine on all levels. Mm, I love that. That's good. Mm-hmm. And I think that that speaks to how we all go through cycles. Like w- it, what's working for us today is not always going to work. And so I love that just that you're listening to your inner voice ask you to evaluate what you need and what mm-hmm. you don't need. Oh. Good stuff. We can all take take (laughs) some advice from that one. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your gifts and your voice with us. I'm so, so grateful. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Do you guys know how super excited I get about bringing you these kinds of guests? Guests like Jennifer, who can really dive deep into ways for us to connect more deeply with who we are. I just love the conversation that we had around resonating with yourself. Like you're not going to resonate with everybody. I'm not going to resonate with everyone. There will be people who I trigger, people who don't like what I have to say. And you know what? That is all fine as long as I'm resonating with myself. And that means being aligned, aligned with my values and aligned with my purpose. And this is not all or nothing, you guys. You don't have to be perfect. Guess what? You're not perfect. Neither am I. Thank God. It would be really hard to be perfect all the time, wouldn't it? (laughs) Um, Yeah, you don't have to be perfect at it. There are going to be times where you come out and then you just give yourself grace And you say, nope, not perfect. It's all good. And you get back on and you get back into that alignment because when you are aligned and your beingness is reflecting exactly who your soul is, let me tell you, that feels so good. It doesn't even matter what you are doing. When your beingness is aligned with your soul, you feel joyful 
you feel fulfilled, you're inspired to do the things that you are supposed to be doing. And that is what it's all about. You guys, that's what we want for you. That's what I want for myself on a daily basis. That's what I want for you. And so I just want to really encourage you to go check out those questions that Jennifer is sharing with with us in her free gift. And also just to dig in to this idea of what it means to resonate with yourself. So good. So, so good. Um, Just a reminder, another way to stay connected with me and to really fill your cup with the words that your heart is longing to hear is to sign up for my newsletter, kellycover.com slash newsletter. I want to be connected with you. I want to feel like I have a way to share with you what's on my heart and for you to have a way to respond back to me. So this is a perfect opportunity. So click on the link, put in your name and your email, and you will be on the list. As always, I want to remind you that yes, you do have a purpose. You are here for a reason And we need you being who you were meant to be. We need you walking on the planet daily, aligned and resonating with yourself. Doesn't that sound amazing? And let me tell you this. I know that you can do this. It is possible for each and every one of you. Please, please don't ever forget that you are worthy.